Welcome to the Filmmaker's Playbook. My name is Jason Brannigan, and this is a podcast all about filmmaking. On today's episode, I'm joined by writer-director Morris O'Carroll and actor-producer Sinead O'Reardon. Sinead and Morris are known for their feature film, Dead Along the Way, their web series, Sucking Diesel, and they have both been nominated for Discovery Awards at Dublin International Film Festival. They world premiered their brand new feature film, Swing Bout, at Dublin International Film Festival this week to much buzz, acclaim and a standing ovation. We spoke before the premiere and we did a deep dive into the making of Swing Bout. We talk about writing the script, independently financing the film to the tune of €120,000, casting and much, much more. I hope you enjoy today's conversation. Morris O'Carroll and Sinead O'Reardon, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having us, Jason. It's, I'm, I'm flattered that you want us on here, so it's going to be great to talk to you. Delighted to be here. It's a pleasure, and I'm so excited to dig into the making of Swing Belt. The film just premiered at Diff. We are obviously recording prior to that, but when this airs, you guys will have had your world premiere um, two nights ago, I believe. Um, yeah. And no doubts that the film is going to be incredibly well received. I wish I could be there, but unfortunately I can't. Before we actually get to the film, I think it's impossible to maybe talk about where you guys are now without looking at, in some sense, where you began. And I think the Bible Basher in coming out around 2013 were your first collaborations together. How did you guys meet and kind of, when did you start working together or what was the thing that I suppose connected you um, and has led you on this 11 year journey to swing belt? Funny enough, it, it was through an audition. I, I'll jump in first, Morris, and then you can finish. But um, it was an audition that I did for Morris um, back in the day. Was, was it for coming out, Morris? I think it was. Um, it was actually a self tape that you had done for someone else because I was working and still am like outside of the system and I had very little access to actors and stuff. And it was Chris Cullen in Cork had um, like a database of Cork actors. And that's how I came across you because he showed me the self tapes and you stood out to me in that. Yeah. And then I think we uh, we went on to do coming out first then wasn't it that was it yeah that like that was my first short and our first short together and like that the minute i met Sinead, you like met her in the car park we were shooting in some whatever venue we were in and it wasn't just that she wanted to you know obviously she was acting and she was the lead actress in the short but it was like that willingness to help. She was like, oh, what can I do? And I can get you this venue and that and the other. So I was like, right, I'm definitely holding on to this one going forward anyway. Yeah, it's funny because I hadn't even done any producing. I probably would, I might have produced a play at that point. Um, but yeah, I wasn't even producing at that point. I was more trying to get work as a, an actor. And that's why I ended up producing really just to produce my own work because I came into acting I suppose later in life did it or like I did it as a kid and as a hobby and stuff but um yeah I came into it later in life and then you know you're just you just have to wear all of the hats and create the work yourself so yeah we we that was our first project together and I can't get rid of him now since <laughs> no you definitely seem like kindred spirits and I think you need to be in order to have the collaborative relationship that you guys have had over the last 10 years as well. Um, obviously, in your EPK, you mentioned that idea of punk filmmaking, which I think is a great way of describing um, how you made Swing Belt, but obviously earlier films as well. I, we could dig into all of your previous work, but I do want to get to Swing Belt. So the only one I'm going to touch on um, is um, Terry McMahon's The Prize Fighter, um, which you edited, Morris. And the reason I think it's worth talking about that is because that seems to have been the genesis for Swing Belt. Um, can you tell me a little bit about finding the story 
of Swing Belt in making that film or in editing that film for Terry in 2018, maybe? Yeah, it was 2018. I think like it was John Connors that brought the project to me. I didn't know it was Terry's uh, film that was to be edited. It just They wanted it re-edited. Um, so John, John Connors brought it to me and I had a look at it and I says, look, leave it with me and I'll have, let me go through it overnight and whatnot. And like, I just connected with Terry's voice in, in the footage and all, you know, and the stuff that I, I didn't see in the original edit. So I gave Terry a call and I says, look, this is how I see it. And he's straight on the phone. He's like, let me come down and see you straight away. And we sat down and it was like, it was one of the best collaborations I've ever had. Um, it was just, it was phenomenal, you know, to sit with him and pick his brain. Cause I admire what he, I think he's, he's the best indie filmmaker in this country. Man's a genius. And I got to sit with him for almost a year and, you know, we just went through the whole thing. And, but there was one section, they never made the final cut, ended up on the cutting room floor, but it was Spike O'Sullivan, who, who the documentary is about. And it's his quest to become world champion over a three fight deal. And he mentioned a swing bout in it. And like, I'm a huge boxing fan. And that's one of the reasons I was drawn to this pro hit the prize fighter. And he mentioned a swing bout. And I was like, I've heard of swing bouts before, but I'm a big boxing fan and I don't even know what it is. And so he explained it, that it's, you know, when you have a fight card, you have, you know, you've the main fight. And then you have your undercard. And let's say the first fight is scheduled to go six rounds, but it only goes one. And then the next fight is scheduled to go eight rounds, but it only goes two. There's a gap opening up in the schedule. So they have these swing bout fighters and Spike explained, you have to go in at the very start of the night, get weighed in, get togged out, get your gloves on, and you're ready to fight from the very start of the night to the very end. And, you know, and it was comical as well because he was saying, I couldn't even go for a piss. I had to ask my coach to go in with me and I was like, oh, there's great comedy in that. Like there's something in that. And if I ever needed to make something in just one room, that would be it. And I tried to work it into a script I had at the time and it just didn't work. And I said, look, I'll put it on the back burner for now and I'll come back to it at some stage. So then once COVID hit, we were all locked down and I was like, no, that's a good lockdown movie, you know, to be trapped and I'll have something claustrophobic. And I just started working on it from there then. And obviously, it's hard to, you know, just to keep stuff in one room all the time. And I didn't want to make a one location film with people just sitting down on benches and talking. So I was like, right, I, you know, I want that crime thriller element to it. And I just started working out and I'd mentioned to Sinead, I said, you know, like we were all on the course together. We were all doing um, our advanced producer course with Screen Ireland. And during it, I was saying to Sinead, look, I have this idea and I'm working on the script. Just leave it with me and I'll, I'll come back, Janet. I have a great role for you in it because I always wanted Sinead to play one of the lead females in it. And so, like, that was the genesis for the idea. Okay, so it sounds like it was almost the idea of the room and the singularity of the location that initially kind of sparked something in you. And then the kind of character side of the thing came afterward. Am I right in saying that? Oh, oh definitely. And you see, like, it was a, the concept of a swing bow, like that was strong to me. And then I was like, right, well, you know, what am I going to hang that off then? And it, and you know, when COVID happened, it was like I was I was already exploring the nature of truth. And back then we didn't know what was right, what was wrong, who was telling the truth, who was telling us lies. And I just wanted to explore that. So it was a perfect time to write Swing Bout. And, you know, like at its core, Swing Bout, it's a story about having the courage to protect the truth at all costs. So I just went from there then and it just, I, I mean, just flowed onto the page for me. Right. So... In terms of your writing process then with this film, what was that like? Or what's your writing process like in general? Do you, did you kind of outline first? Do you just dive in, trying to put words on paper? And um, how did you approach kind of constructing 
this film? Yeah, it's a, I, like when I first started writing, I'd always, I, you know, had to think, I have to write so many pages a day, or even if I write, if I have to do a paragraph, and I would religiously do that in the beginning. And then it got to a point where I was just giving myself permission that I was actually writing all day, because if I would watch a bad film, I would deconstruct it and say, well, like, what was wrong with that? And for me, that's the writing process. And even when I'm watching a TV show, I'm... I'm looking at the writing. So every minute of the day, I feel like I'm writing all the time. And I get all these ideas. And I think, like when you're putting something together, you have one idea, and then you have this old idea. And it's about matching them together and making them blend. And so it was very much the same with Swing Bout. Like there's a couple of the subplots that were in it. Like there's one subplot with the boxing promoters and that's a story I heard in a bar in London years ago. And it was a true story and I just, you know, twisted it my own little way. Um, so it's, for me, it's just about marrying ideas together. Okay. And how many, I'm always curious to know how many drafts, um, writers have done of scripts before they get to the point of okay this is the film I want to shoot I'm sure it still changes after that fact when you begin the process of casting but how how many drafts did you do of the script or even how many did you do before you brought it to Sinead um I can't remember how many I had done before I brought it to Sinead but I would have went through probably six to eight drafts, and I don't know exactly. And sometimes I would abandon the draft during writing, and I'd go right back to the start again. I'd say, you know, so I, I don't actually, you know, log it. I don't say, oh, this is draft one, this is draft two. I just, and I like to get into that kind of flow state when I'm writing, you know, and at the beginning, it's just like, I put as much as possible onto the page, and then I just start rewriting. So it's a, a lot of it's just editing, editing as I go along then. Yeah. I like that idea of, you know, abandoning a draft or having written a script, going back and trying to rewrite from page one without actually referencing the previous, because I think your brain is automatically going to remember the parts that were engaging or exhilarating for you and maybe leave some of the less interesting aspects behind. Yeah, and no, I, I totally agree with that. Um, so, Sinead, when Morris did bring the script to you, you knew he was developing this film. Um, how did he pitch it to you? Or how did he convince you that this was the next film we need to make? You know what? It doesn't take much for Morris to convince me. Like, you mentioned earlier about us being kindred spirits. Um, we really are, you know, Um I couldn't think of anyone better to work with. So he mentioned it to me. Actually, there was another film that we were we were going to work off first, Morris, wasn't it? Um, Pure True. Um, but he, he started talking about Swing Bell to me and I knew nothing. I'm not into boxing at all. Like I knew nothing about boxing. I My learning curve was very steep for this project. Um, but uh, we we were we were talking as well about uh, we shot conversations with my dead father, which is a, a Screen Ireland funded short film. It was with Kieran Birmingham. We were shooting that down in Cork, and um, Morris was talking about. I think you were talking about Swing about then, Morris and. Um, I just, I, we, we just, I, I literally turned around to him. We had a scene that we were shooting in the graveyard and I turned around to him and I said, I will help you fund that film. I will get funding for that film and we're going to make it. And that's where it came from. And we just went hell for leather then. I actually pitched it to her in a graveyard. Yeah, that's right. A graveyard of all places. <laughs> that's brilliant. So was there... Was there a hook for you in terms of story um, or an element of it that particularly excited you? Or was it, again, just the relationship and that you both knew, you know, going into it that we can do this together? I suppose the hook for me was, um, well, I suppose the, the fact that there was a female lead role on offer as well. 
Um, and I loved the role. I mean, you've seen the film, Jason, so she's a piece of work, like absolute piece of work. I love her. I love that character. And definitely, you know, just the fact that we were going to be working together again, you know, um, yeah, I just jumped on board straight away. I just, I loved the idea. I loved the concept. I loved the fact that we, it was going to be all contained in sort of one area, which I knew as a producer straight away that that would kind of make my job a little bit easier. Um, obviously we had to find that, 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 that place to shoot then as well. Um, that's kind of another story in itself, but yeah, no, I mean, I was, I was in, in straight away. Amazing. And you mentioned finding the location and it being contained, but I think in, again, haven't seen the film and anyone who had the pleasure of seeing it at the world premiere um, will see that, yes, it's a contained film, but I think you were really ambitious in terms of your location and it looks fantastic. Um, I know in your EPK, um, there's a mention of shooting it in Morris's shed at one point. Yeah, we were never going, we were never going to shoot it in a shed. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Um, we were very lucky. We we had we, we were actually going to shoot it initially in um SBG gym down in Cork and um they were giving us their location. Uh, Liam O. Griffin, who has a, a a role in the film and actually who was our stunt coordinator, he was so kind to us and really wanted wanted to facilitate anything we uh we 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 needed and he um he trained some of the the the, the boxers as well the girl but the, the girl actors but he was in, initially giving us his gym and he was allowing us to build this uh we were going to build an actual locker room because you know a lot of it takes place in this locker room so we, he was going to allow us to construct a whole set in one of his rooms in the gym and um, it just worked out too costly. It was massive, massive money. And it was actually luck really, because that kind of forced us then to, to look elsewhere. And it was the production designer, Darren O'Mani, who mentioned to me, he said, why don't you ask Parky Cueve? And I was thinking, oh, no way am I going to get Parky Cueve? Not a feckin' chance, you know? So I, we approached Parky Cueve and I was just, I was upfront and honest with them. And I said, look, we're making an independent film. I had set aside something like 15, 10 to 15 grand to build the set. Uh, it was coming in at something stupid, like 70,000 or something. And I said, this is what I have. I have 15,000 euro. Uh, can you give us parts of Parky Cueve for a month, please? And they were, again, talking about landing on our feet those people were so amazing to work with actually some of them are coming to the premiere but they were so kind to us there was nothing nothing was a problem they allowed us to shoot in whatever location we wanted within the stadium and we were very lucky because we virtually had it to ourselves now there was a few corporate events going on and you had a few GAA players coming in doing a bit of training and stuff every now and then all right Sorry, that's my dog barking in the background. Um, so uh, yeah, we were we were just very fortunate with Parky Cueve was perfect location. Brilliant. And like I said, it just it lends so much production value um to the film in and of itself, just by being what it is. And why and why we were gonna shoot it in my shed, Jason, was it was uh again like I'm I'm wrote it during COVID. And like people forget that we were here and oh, there's this new normal and people aren't going to go to the cinema ever again and cinema's going to die and are we ever going to be able to shoot again? And I just wanted to, I was like, I don't believe that. And I wanted to, like we had a film ready to go in 2020 and that got knocked on its head with COVID. So I, that's, you know, I started writing Swing Bout then and I was like, if I can make something in a contained area, and I was saying to Sinead, we'll do it in my shed if we have to do it. If we have to shoot it on my mobile phone, we're gonna shoot it on the phone, but we're going to make a film and we're going to have our own little bubble. And so it actually then turned into a great production model because once we got the likes of Parky Cueve, like there was no unit moves during the day. 
everything was contained in the one area and we and we could literally shoot it linear and we did like except for the first three days we put in some filler stuff but then we shot linear from there to the very end and then we'd maybe a couple of days at the end of production where again we just you know filled in some of the scenes um like corridor stuff and whatnot but um it turned into a fantastic production model so it actually you know worked in our favor and actually it worked in our favor as well because it was january and um and that worked out in just loads of different things for us we were fortunate with in terms of crew were available cast were available equipment was available we got a absolute sound deal from Colin from Film Equipment Hire so we were very lucky but again because it was January there wasn't much happening in the stadium so if we were to film e even in February like from February onwards they were getting really really busy so it kind of um it gave us the, the the momentum as well then that we needed to have this shot in whatever it was 19 days like it was structured and we had to shoot these scenes in these days because there was a game coming on like being played one of the weekends and there was a, another corporate event happening so we we had to get them done in those in those days so yeah yeah, there was no wiggle room. Once once we went into production, there was no wiggle room at the end. We were like, right, we have to start here and we have to finish at that, this point and there's no pickups. So we just yeah. had to nail it. And again, like it was Mark O'Rourke, our DOP, who suggested January to us because we wanted to shoot in October. And we were like, right, we need to get this film off of the ground. And we were dead set on October. And he suggested January because he's like, look, you know, obviously, you, you know, a lot of people don't want to shoot in January because you've very little light and if you have unit moves and whatnot. But because we were all in the one location, he was like, it'd be a good time to shoot it and you'll have access to a lot of crew and you'll be able to get good deals on the gear and stuff. And so it was fantastic for us. Yeah, it's great. Look, no unit moves and you're not fighting the light because you're indoors as well. Brilliant. Love it. Um, to backtrack just a little... So Sinead, so after Morris pitched you the idea for the film, the decision was made. This is what we're going to make. What was the first step you took to get the ball moving? I read the script. <laughs> so, um, yeah, read the script. And basically, I I suppose I I do what any producer would do and, and, and think about how we were going to actually finance it. And we did have the discussion about, you know, we looked up the various um, Screen Ireland funding uh, channels that we are routes that we could have gone down. But we were gunning to make a film and really we we just we kind of we didn't want to wait for that for that whole process, because, you know, it's a lengthy process when you go through all that that funding. Um, so it. It was basically, yeah, trying to figure out how we were going to fund it. And and then I suppose casting, because casting was, we had such, it was such a large cast. Um, and like it, for me as well, I needed to learn about boxing and boxing terminology. And, you know, like I really knew nothing about boxing at all. So I guess, yeah, I, I we thought about the money aspect first and, like as soon as I have like as soon as someone hands me a project, I just like I I run with it like and I just I do everything in my power just to get it off the ground as quickly as possible, you know. So um I think I think yeah we just started discussing casts straight away and and then wondering what kind of a casting brief we were going to put out and stuff and um, because as you know it's all female it's female driven you know so if I can pull on the financing thread are you guys able to openly share your budget yeah how much did you make the film for so we're up at about one hundred and twenty thousand. um obviously that's going to go up if you want to include festivals and you know we we haven't paid anything out for pr or publicity yet so we want to go down the road of working with the publicist as well. So I'd say it'll be up around the 140 mark, I would imagine, by the time we're finished. Um, yeah, and that it was all, do you know what? It was big, borrowed, stole, 
you know, savings, children's allowance, all of the above. Yeah. So. So you guys, I guess then in terms of financing it, it was like a more of a private equity model than anything else. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. And was it difficult for you to raise that kind of money or did you have a budget level? Did you say this is the minimum we need to make it or were you kind of just saying, let's get as much as we can, but we're going one way or another? I'll, I'll jump in here because um, when we agreed to move forward on it and Sinead said, look, I'll, I'll get the finances for it. I can definitely get 15 grand and I was like well that would pay for sandwiches and stuff that'd be great we can make a film with that that's colossal for me and then it just started rising and rising and rising <laughs> yeah it, it just yeah it got costly like initially it was yeah 15 grand and then it was up at around 40 grand and then it was 50 grand and then sure by the end of it you know yeah they just and I mean like 120,000 as you know it's pennies like it's pittance when it comes to making a film but you know obviously it's still a lot of money to to try to come up with um but you know we were just we were lucky that it didn't escalate further really because you know just with the fact that we shot in January the fact that cast and crew were very kind to us in terms of working for deferred payments and stuff as well you know we we obviously had to pay crew in terms of renting their their equipment and all of the gear and stuff but like basically you know and I and I, and I know this is a very touchy subject with people the whole deferred payment thing but like we were very honest from the start we were like this is a passion project sorry my dog um this is a passion project and we're go we're going to shoot this in January and if if people want to come on board please come on board you know but it's 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 an independent film it's probably not going to make any money but you you'll you'll have a good time making it and we're going to make something really special here yeah and like that like if we went down the screen Ireland route you know we would have went into development it would have taken another couple of years before we got going and as I explained to everyone would probably get to the stage where Screen Ireland might say to me, look, Morris, you've done a great job writing and directing it, but you can't edit it. Let's hand that off to someone else. And I was determined to edit the film as well. Because um, for me, they're all like the writing, the directing and the editing, they're all branches of the one tree for me. So that was important that for this film that I wanted to do that. And as I pitched to the actors, I was, I was saying, look, if I got Screen Ireland funding, then you would get paid, but they probably wouldn't want you on the film because you're an emerging artist. They might want someone else, and but I can guarantee you this role now if you take it. And you, as Sinead said, we were very honest, you know, in saying, look, we're probably going to make no money. We're, you know, unless we're one in a million with that story, we're not going to get paid for this, but it's you. you will have you will go on a journey with this film. You know, we promise and we like, we, we feel we were good enough to get into Diff. Like that was our number one festival that we wanted to get into. And, um, and so they were all on board with it. Like I've no problem with this type of model, you know, pitching to people because we don't have the money to pay them. Yeah, and I, I know some artists like, you know, uh, and I understand it, like the whole not getting paid thing. I, I'm, I'm an actor myself, you know, first and foremost, but, you know, I, I, I've done plenty of unpaid work and, and I do it for the, the creativity involved and for the absolute love of it, you know. So, like, we we're very lucky to get all these like minded people. And that's what we needed was this like minded team who, you know, were just wanting to jump on board with us and, and just shoot something really good, you know. So, yeah. I think it's a testament to both of you and your previous work that people were willing to come on board as well because you have in the past made exciting work that has found audiences and found homes so I would assume everyone coming on was acutely aware of that as well that they weren't coming on to a picture that may never see the light of day which is really important and 
in terms of your budget and spend, I think personally, what I love to see is the money on screen. And I think most people do. And I think you took that money and made it look like more, which is also really, I think, important and a testament to both of you in the process um, in making this film. So, Yeah, we said from the start that we, like when any project we do, we always try to raise the bar higher and higher. And we really wanted to um, have really strong production values with this. So, you know, even though it's low money, you know, the money that went into obviously the venue, but it went into the costuming and it went into the production design and it went into the amazing, you know, Noel McGilligan was fantastic with lighting, you know, um, so and then the gear that we rented as well. So it's all those things really add up, I suppose, to to give you stronger production values, you know, then we wouldn't have had that in our previous projects we'd have had a few lights you know whereas no rocks up with a van load of like you know all of the gear you know so we were uh yeah we were fortunate in that sense as well and, and i wanted to mention noel before you did as an example you know because you were saying it's testament to both of us but it's testament to our crew as well like after a couple of days noel was looking and you know, like he brought a van load of stuff like lights i've never had before and he's like I need to drive back to Kerry and I need to bring extra stuff. And it's a case of, you know, when we were shooting, he would ask Mark, have I got another 10 minutes to light this? Cause I just want to get it just right. And you know, then when you've the crew on board like that, that they are passionate about it as well, you know, you're onto something good. Like you can feel it when you're on set. So it's testament to them as well. You know, like they did jump in and just like elevated it above like the 120 grand that we had in it. We also gave them creative freedom. So every artist we had a conversation with, be it crew or cast, and we said, push the bar, like, you know, this is your project as, as much as, as it is ours. So like, you know, push the boat out, do, do whatever you feel is necessary in terms of, you know, raising the bar um, production wise. And, and, and the same with cast, like they had a lot of creative freedom and in the choices that they made as well. And we, yeah, I think they were happy enough with, with having that discussion before we went into it, you know. That's great. And I think it's such an important part of the process is right, giving your HOD, like, autonomy um that they're not being micromanaged and you know that they're going to be better than you at what they do so trusting everyone in that kind of process um so important if we were to take a step back and go back to casting um i was curious about the casting process for the film and how you found your cast and maybe lessons that you learned through that process so i suppose if we were to start with what was the process itself i'll jump in first Sinead in that i had certain people like i knew Sinead was going to play emma the coach um i had a couple of roles that i had johnny elliot mark down for um i knew that i wanted ben condren to play one of the promoters um so a uh, basically cast that we've worked with before there were certain people I was like right they'll fit that role so I knew you know we had we had some of them filled to begin with and then the difficult thing was to to cast the lead boxer uh, Tony so like we, we knew everything kind of had to come off of her so we didn't act I didn't say to Johnny you're going to play one of the coaches and I didn't say to Ben you're going to play the promoter I need we we needed to find the lead actress first and then work off of her so I'll let you jump in Sinead then to how we the process we went down yeah so um I suppose it was it was an it was a hard enough uh casting process in the sense that because they're boxers they had to have a similar you know when you're boxing you have to be in this that particular weight profile or whatever so we had to find boxers that matched each other in terms of height 
and weight. Um, what is it? What's the the term? Weight. A weight category, like their physicality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I clearly haven't learned that much <laughs> from the boxing world. Well, yeah, the weight category. So, but we just put together a brief, a casting brief, you know, and um, you know, we made it look good, and we just lashed it out there, you know, um, all over social media and. Um, the word word got around, and uh, fish pond as well. You know, they were they were very helpful to us, and word got around, and we just got probably hundreds of self tapes from young, you know, actors. Um, and, and obviously we had a, a particular audition piece for them all to do then as well. So, um, but as soon as we saw Kira Berkeley, you know, we just we knew it. Like we knew that she was our lead. That was it. And actually, Morris, you can explain this a bit more, but Kira wasn't even what Morris had originally envisioned, looks wise, I guess, as a lead actor. Um, I'll let you explain that one more, Morris. Yeah, like looks wise, uh, personality wise, she, she was totally left field to what I was looking for. And like I was struggling when I seen, I was like, no, that's her. I knew it. I was like, that's going to be the box or that's going to be our lead actress and it was like it was I, I've described it as it was like a gift from the gods but I was still struggling with it because I was tied to the idea of what I was looking for but like within within hours I was like right that's her so we're, we're going with that and I had to have even Kira was saying to me she's like mm, like am I believable as a boxer and I had to show her examples of female boxers and say look this is how this girl started and look, she's very pretty, this girl, and yet she gets into the ring and puts her life on the line. And so, you know, we had to have them conversations with her. And but like as soon as she came on set, like even when she I, I'll never forget the first day she walked out, she was in the full gear because we shot the corridor stuff first and she's walking down and I could see JJ, our focus putter, looking at her. And he's like, is this her? Is this the lead actress? This is she's supposed to be the boxer. And as soon as we called action, like the excitement among the crew when they seen her walk, because she just turned into a monster walking down that corridor. And like Mark, the DOP, is saying to me, I could shoot her all day, all day. And JJ is saying to me, where did you find her? I was like, she fell into our laps. What was it about Kira's initial tape then that really struck a chord with you? Was there anything... That you can kind of like, and I know it can be very hard to put your finger on these things, but was there something in it that just landed? Like with a with most self tapes, you're gonna see the same thing over and over and over again. Like people are just playing to type, and there was this inner life going on underneath her performance, and she wasn't playing a boxer; she was playing a human in a conflict situation. And it just, and, and like, you see her on film, like she's just, like the camera absolutely loves her then as well. So she's very charismatic. Um, so like, I was just drawn to that straight away. She just stood out head and shoulders above everyone else. Well, when I watched the film, one of the notes I had made um, for, as a discussion point was, I think her, Kira as Tony, there's just a great sense of inner life that's consistently going on. You can feel everything. As much as she's in that room, she's kind of always somewhere else and there's so much going on. And I thought her performance was fantastic. So, And I had that discussion with her um, because she's probably got the least amount of lines. And I said that, I said, you have the least amount of lines out of all this ensemble. And yet you've got the most to do you have to sell that in her life and that's why we've picked you and like she did it in spades i suppose as an actor hat absolutely hat, hats off to her she really did her work like she did her background work her backstory you know um she she's phenomenal and she's got these just big massive brown bambi eyes you know she just you just but like those they're, they're not Bambi in in the film like as Mara said she turns into that that monster who's gunning for you know searching for truths and staying true to her 
core values and integrity and everything and you can see all the kind of in the goings on inside her brain like she did such amazing work was there any particular takeaways or lessons then morris from the casting process in this by the sounds of it i guess it's just a case of being open and being willing to be surprised but was there anything else that in having to go through hundreds of self tapes and kind of whittle them down that you learned this time that maybe you hadn't had as an experience on some of your previous work um i don't think so no um i wouldn't have any extra takeaways like i would just i i always say to other actors i'm like like don't go in and play to type on a, an audition like and and don't just turn on the mobile phone and just record it like have a think about it and you know you, I, I see it all the time I see actors just going through the motions with the self tape and it's going to be exactly the same as the next guy the next girl um, it's about you know like go in and have fun with it make a bold choice and stand out but you know stand out like for a reason you know find the bold choice in that script and then be brave enough to play it I love that it's all about making bold choices yeah, I'd probably go down the road of getting a casting director on board the next time for sure, because it was a lot of work and, you know, casting directors are brilliant at at, at sourcing, you know, and, and finding the talent. But it was hard for us because it was going to be a deferred payment basis. So you, you can't really ask a casting director to put out a brief to say, well, you know, it's unpaid and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, but um, yeah, I, I if, if if we had proper funds, for the next one, I'd go down the, the casting director route, definitely. Yeah, I think it's, so, it's such a labor intensive process when all of a sudden you have 200 tapes and you have to go and watch them all and try and whittle them down, you know? But do you know what? It was a great learning for me, though, as an actor as well, because, you know, I suppose it was my first time watching a load of tapes coming in. So it was interesting to see how a lot of actors did actually all play the same you know, and like you get everyone gets the same brief and the same script and you kind of sometimes you can preempt your 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 delivery or how you're going to say things in an audition. But you do have to do the background work, you know, and that's exactly what Kira did. And that's why she stood out. She didn't she didn't take the the, the safe choice, make the safe choice or, you know, she she just she was bold. So, yeah. So you mentioned um having to kind of cast according to weight weight categories and stuff how what was your process like then for prepping the film because i'm going to assume that most of um your cast maybe weren't boxers didn't have massive amounts of boxing experience so I, it's kind of a double barrel question one is what was the process like in terms of learning the physicality of being a boxer and um, then the overall maybe rehearsal process or whether you kind of had one in terms of working with um, the ensemble. Yeah. Do you want to jump in, Morris? Uh, no, I'll, I'll let you explain it. I'll just say about the... Um, it wasn't just about the physicality and about learning boxing. What I wanted them to do was go in and see what a boxer is really like. Because people have this stereotype stereotypical notion of what a boxer is and yet when you go in and you meet them they're humble they've got integrity they're hard working they're super motivated like they're great people and they're gentle you know because they have to go in as a profession and you know fight for their lives inside a ring but they're so gentle outside of it and i wanted them to see you know because i didn't want that to creep in people playing a boxer during the film i'd want them to see what they were really like and you know like neil uh, one of our boxers in the film she that's one of the things she took away from the gym seeing what they're actually like in real life um and then of course there was you know we we couldn't have them not being able to box not being able to walk properly not being able to hit the gloves properly but i let you so Sinead you were part of that process yeah so i mean as i i mean as an actor like the first thing you do straight away is you 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 have to learn about boxing right so um we 
even like when it comes down to gloves and putting the gloves on and you know it, it all had to be believable and our brief actually our casting brief was um you know it's a it's a film about boxing but no boxing will be required uh which was actually kind of funny really because all all the girls were training in in various boxing gyms like we had myself and Kira were and Johnny were training in um white white collar boxing there with Terry O'Neill you might know Terry Jason he's an actor and a boxer and uh, Terry's brilliant so Terry was training us and then Liam O Griffin is an in, in MMA um coach he was training the girls down in Cork so like we all definitely had to learn you know and, pa- um, and Packy Collins Packy Collins yeah Packy Collins was brilliant as well we um we myself and Chrissy trained with him actually as well for for a few times and yeah just learning basically the terminology learning like the physicality the moves the you know how to lace or you know lace, lace your, your your hands and um wrap your hands rather and then you know the the gloves and everything and like it was just it was so much work involved and then me as a boxing coach which is completely different to a boxer you know, um, and I found that very hard actually because you know you have to learn how to call the to call the moves and stuff, and that used to just completely wreck my brain. <laughs> it used to be kind of funny, really, because I got boxed in the face a couple of times by Kira, but um, yeah, so it was like all the girls were brilliant though; they really jumped in, and and like we were so lucky with our coaches and stuff as well, you know. And it was great to see their journey from when they started because my brother used to box, uh, you know, when in his early 20s and he did a bit of MMA stuff, nothing professional or, you know, but um, he'd know, he'd know the game. And I sent him a couple of videos of the girls at the start and he's like, oh my God, you're in so much trouble. Like Kira just couldn't throw a punch. Like it was hilarious to watch her. But you could like the dedication and to see where she ended up on. And he, and when we weren't shooting, she'd be, uh, you know, inside the green room and she, she'd be with Liam O'Griffin and she's hitting the gloves. So like that dedication all the way through. And a lot of the girls said they would keep up the box and then because they enjoyed it. You know, it was a great workout for them and whatnot. But it was fantastic just to see that, that transformation with them, you know, from these like sweethearts into monsters. Yeah, and, and like you could see Kira in the film there as well, the way she's kind of warming up the shoulders and the neck and everything. And like that was all down to Terry O'Neill. Terry was like showing her like what you do before you get into a ring. You know, these are the, the moves you do and you're like warming up and the thoughts that are going through your head and you're psyching yourself up. And like you can totally see that in, in the film with her, you know. Um, 100%. And I think I believe every punch that is thrown in the film. Um, and I believed you as coach Emma as well, Sinead. So you. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> we just stand in for Sinead. Oh yeah. It was funny because um yeah, we had Liam at one point, like when when Kira's boxing, when when we were doing the close up, I just my head was wrecked at that stage because I was calling all the moves or whatever. But so when we went in for the close up, we got Liam to stand in for me and put the gloves on. So then Kira could properly actually like prop, throw proper punches because she's worked with Liam, obviously, as a coach. Do you know what I mean? So it was actually very fun. Well, you, well, you wouldn't know this, Sinead, but there's actually very little of Liam stuff there. A lot of it's yours. Really? Yeah. 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 OK, well, that's good. Well, there you go now. Yeah. No, you did great. I have to say as well that one thing we haven't really touched on is the difficulty of performing and producing the film as well and having to quickly alternate between those two things, being the producer who was problem solving and then having to just, okay, they're ready for you on the floor, go over, okay, uh, we're going to go action. It's a discipline for sure. It's... um it's very hard um to switch hats but you just learn how to do it uh, and it's funny actually because i was just diagnosed with add so i think it kind of comes <laughs> uh, it's it's like favorable for me actually because my mind is like on so many different things uh, producing wise i can just like get everything done but 
then the thing with ADD as well is that you 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 hyper focus so you've got this hyper like focus superpower I want to call it so when it came to switching over to be a character I I would manage to just drop all those racing production thoughts and actually put on the actor's cap and um and just apply myself and it is a very difficult thing to do, but I was very lucky as well because I worked with a brilliant acting coach for months beforehand um, because I just needed to give myself that dedicated time to acting. So I worked with a coach twice a week and I had my two hours a week with him and that allowed me to kind of form who Emma was then as well and, and like do all my backstory and everything so that when cameras did roll, I knew exactly who she was, you know. And... Rehearsal time on in film and telly can be almost nil. Were you able to carve out any rehearsal time with the ensemble or with like pockets of cast, Morris? Um, not before the shoot, but I made a point of um, myself and Mark, the DOP, sat down and I said to him, we're going to have rehearsals before we shoot. So it was a case of, I could go in if it took an hour, if it took half a day, we would get the rehearsals and then you know, then we're flowing once we're shooting. Um, and because, you know, at some stages there was like, there was up to 15 casts inside the dressing room and that was over the course of like five, six days. And so, you, you know, you're trying to match eye lines and, um, you know, composition and everything. You know, we were starting to go stir crazy now. So it was so important to rehearse and you know make sure we blocked out everything so that it was good that it wasn't going to be a mess and I, I like i think i spent almost a day once we got to that stage where we had all them people in it was a very like that was my most challenging part of the shoot so i had to have rehearsals for all of that and I like to, I, it's good for the actors as well, you know, to get into the room and say, okay, where are we going to go? And where does this feel good for you? And just block everything out. And then the crew come in and then it just, it's it's easy from that. But not easy, but it, you know, makes the process um, a lot more fluid than when we're shooting. And then you can, you know, you've got the, the room to take extra takes and explore further once you've that groundwork put in with the rehearsals. Now, I'd love to be in position. I think we all would, you know, where you could have rehearsals before you even before you even kick off into production. But uh, no, we didn't have that luxury. But you did meet with all the, the car, like the, the cast beforehand and you had the discussion work with them and you helped them. You, you described who their character was and that. Oh, and I, like I like to talk to everyone on an individual basis, you know, before we get to set and when we're on set. Um, and, you know, we just go through their character and, you know, if they want backstory, I'll give them a backstory, whatever the actor needs, really. And um, just so that we're going in the right direction. And as I would say to all of them, look, I'm very open to to explore further when we're on set. Like, you can't make a wrong decision here and let's try everything. And so, you know, just give them that freedom to express themselves and, you know, and dig into the character. I think that's where the really good work comes from, you know, when, once you give the actors that freedom and same with the crew. I agree 100 percent. Again, it's just that thing of trusting your collaborators. Um, you nailed it there with the word trust, though. Trust is everything when it comes to filmmaking. You know yourself, Jason, you form this filmmaking family like that, that that exists, you know, and um, trust is paramount. Um, like and myself and Kira, you know, like we would have maybe we didn't even rehearse all that much together but we we trained together and everything and like we discussed a lot about her backstory my backstory and stuff and you know I think when it came to having all that work done when the cams cameras rolled then like and, and you do have that creative freedom I mean it, it was just magic there was like for me as an actor I was shaking after one of the scenes I just it, it was just magic, you know, just having that creative freedom and the trust in 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 the person you're acting opposite, you know. Morris, you mentioned um, rehearsing with cast and figuring out some of the blocking, which brings me to um, some of the 
visuals, I guess I'd love to dig into. Um, I think there's a great visual economy in the film, particularly um, the opening when you kind of introduce us to the world. How long does that take? Now, I know the first take, it, it was it was actually seven minutes because we stayed with Tony at the end of it and she was going through her warm up. So I cut it down. So it's probably like between five and six minutes of a one take. It's such a great way to open the film and I think introduce us to that kind of compression chamber of the backstage area and what's going on. What I know from my own experience is sometimes you know, we have these ideas of going, oh, listen, we're going to do it in one take. And it feels like that should be way simpler. Um, but figuring out the dance of a six minute take and making sure everyone hits their marks um, or focus points are hit can be really challenging. So how long did you take to rehearse that and to block that? And how many times did you have to go on it in, in order to capture what you wanted? So I, I knew that it would be messy to introduce so many characters with a lot of coverage. You know, but like you can lose an audience very quickly that way. And I was like, one take is the best option here. And I didn't hit mark the DOP with it until a couple of days before we shot. I said, how would you feel about a one take at the start? He goes, I'd love it. So I was like, great, that's what we're going to do. So what we did was we were shooting corridor footage and we had, we obviously the dressing room was free. So whoever was available would go in and rehearse. So I would jump from the set into the dressing room. I would rehearse with them. I would block it out. I'd say, okay, I would just anchor something. I was like, okay, this is our anchor here. And we'll work off of that. So over the course of three days, I was rehearsing on and off with them. And then we went in on the morning of the shoot to shoot that one take and I was spent a few hours with them. I can't remember exactly, like time just disappeared for me on set. So, but I spent quite a bit of time in there with them and I would shoot it on my mobile phone. And then that was helpful to Mark and he knew exactly where everyone was going. And, and like, you know, there was always a spanner in the works because we had, um, we had like a stabilizer and we were going to shoot it because myself and Mark agreed to shoot the whole film handheld, but we wanted to start it on a stabilizer and then lose it once the fight fix was established and then go handheld from there. But we lost the stabilizer from day one. So we had to do the whole thing handheld, but like, I, I think it added to it anyway. And so, um, I, I just showed Mark my mobile footage. I was like, this is where they all go. It was all blocked out. Then the difficulty is actually shooting it because as you know, it's just so much goes wrong. But because it was so well rehearsed, we were actually kind of nailing a lot of them. It might be a slight bit of performance. Someone would forget a line. Timing could be slightly off. Focus puller might say, I'm not happy with that. But I think we only did like nine of them. Um, so, and, and like we, and we were running them quickly after one another, but so we, we put in the groundwork beforehand and I think it was probably the fifth one that we actually used. Brilliant. Yeah. And I knew that was the one I was like, that's it. That's it. And I was going around congratulating everyone. And they were like, well, so we've got more time. Let's keep pushing it. And I was like, yeah, let's keep going. And then we got to probably the ninth one and they were like no nah, that's the take that's the best one and you know like the camera crew probably just felt it but performance wise and the energy and the feeling it was the fifth one and that's the one I ended up using. I think that's a really important um, thing you've struck on there as well it's that thing of one knowing the one that works and two kind of everyone is going to fight a little bit for the best one for them but you're the one who I guess has oversight of like the big picture and know what works on all fronts. So um, even nine takes, I think still a really good number for how well composed that opening kind of sequence and introduction to the, to the world is. And in one sense, losing the stabilizer could have been a, you know, a little piece of magic because um, there's a great energy to the camera um, and 
to the film and to the world because it is handheld. So um, kudos to, you know, being able to just adapt and go, right, well, we have to do it handheld. Oh, and, and like, that's what filmmaking is about, isn't it? And I, like, that's where the magic happens. It's like these little accidents and you just have to make it work. Um, and like that, you know, we there is quite a few long takes in it. You know, like we, like I sat down with Mark from day one, and you know, I said, "Look, do you want to shoot it on anamorphic?" He said, "I'd love to shoot it on anamorphic." I was like, "Let's do it!" And everyone was saying, "Oh my God, you're shooting an indie film on anamorphics with no budget." And we were like, "Yeah, we're going for it." Um, we established very early that we wanted to shoot on the wider lens, then go into the into the the 65 then onto the 100 and then stay on the 100 and we did like and we religiously stayed on it like you know from a certain point of the film you know just to enhance that claustrophobic feel as we went along um and he's fantastic to work with marco rourke like you know like we um we did one take where like i went in and i blocked it out with the actors and again it was a it was a, it was a shorter one take that I had in mind to do. And I actually wrote it out because we were in like five days and Mark would be saying to me, are you okay with this? Are you okay with that? And, and I knew that he, he's doing exactly what I want from the film. And so I wrote down on my phone exactly what I wanted from this take. And I brought him in with the crew and I said, so act it out there for Mark. Actors did their bit. And Mark said, I, I see it, we, you know, we film it from the back of our head, blah, blah, blah. And I showed him my phone and it's verbatim what I wanted. And I said, look, we're in each other's heads. Let's just work from here on. And so, you know, we were on the same page all the way through. That's brilliant. And it's what I think we all want. I am going to guess that some of that comes from conversations you had with Mark before getting into the film talking about like the tone and the style and what you wanted to achieve which brings me to I guess my next question which is how did you communicate with Mark in terms of and your production designer and costume and with Sinead in terms of saying this is how I want the film to look so this is these are the things we need and um, what was your process for kind of prepping the film in that sense and making sure all of your HODs knew exactly what you wanted. Yeah, well, I've, I've explained with Mark and yeah, we did. We'd had them conversations beforehand and we've worked together in the past. So we've got this shorthand now. And like if one of us was in trouble on set, we just need to give each other a look and we'd help each other out. Um, and that's the same with all the HODs, like with costume. I let uh, Sinead talk more with costume because she was more, I would just say, look, this is what a boxing outfit looks like. These are the colours we want for each character. And then Sinead worked on, did a lot with costume and with the costume designer. Um, and again, with the other HODs, the likes of Noel, I would just give him the freedom to say, look, this is the look we want. This is the feeling we want from the scene. What do you suggest? And, you know, he came up with how to light the dressing room, which was amazing. And it just gave it, because... As I would say to Noel, I want us to work 360. I want the dressing room lit so that we can just go into little pockets of light um, and that we're not going to lose anyone anywhere. So the actors have the freedom to move. And then we go into rehearsals and we would shoot that, block it out, and then bring in all the crew and say, this is where they're all landing. Might put down a couple of little marks, but it was, you know, they had a lot of freedom to move around the dressing room. Um, so yeah, I let Sinead talk about, you know, costume and the other uh, departments. Yeah, so like, yeah, I, I, I was very much involved in the, the production design and the costume design. Um, uh, I worked with Darren quite a lot. You know, we, you know, in the film, you see all these posters of boxers in the background and um, we've got a very large uh, banner of two boxers faces and uh, basically, you know, we had to get all of those people in. Some of them are MMA um, boxers. We had to get them in for individual shoots. And and then Darren did up the posters. And um, so we, but Morris, I mean, you, you obviously gave us, you know, templates to work from too. You knew what you wanted from the, the posters and the, 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 the design there. 
um, in terms of costuming, you had your colors. So basically myself and Kira worked together on sourcing, like everything's authentic, you know, the boxing gloves cost us a, a kidney, you know, they were so expensive. And like we wait, we went for the proper eight ounce boxing gloves as well, because that's the proper uh, uh, weight for and uh, size for, for, for fight night or whatever. And um, yeah, we got all of our, all of the stuff really we got from the UK and we went, just went back and forth with pictures and, you know, ran it by Morris then as well and got customized uh, boxing shorts and, and robes and everything. So it took it took a long time to kind of get them all together. But um, yeah, we got there. It was great. I, I enjoyed it. I did fashion design before. Morris always mocks me over this, but I did do it um, before. So I, I kind of know what I'm about when it comes to costuming as well. So it was very much a, a kind of a a process that I enjoyed as well and being involved in and obviously Kira is the costume designer so um I was back and forth with her a lot so you know she'd be sending me pictures and but you know whatnot so and I had a very definite idea like you know I wanted a strong look with the costumes almost satirical you know like with the boxing promoters and especially one of the brothers like these bold loud suits and um and like i would see i would see i i could be at an event and i'd see a band and they'd have fancy shoes on and i would take a picture of the shoes i go these would be incredible now for one of, for the boxing promoters and this is the website that you could get them from and i will get something cheaper though Sinead. but Sinead would push the boat out and get them expensive shoes i think i'm the only director in history that has to rein the producer in <laughs> I know I get in, I get in trouble with my husband as well though to be fair when it comes to clothes and shoes and stuff like that I just kind of well, it's not yeah. just the clothes it's like even the poster like we've this huge poster um I don't even know the dynam dyna dimensions of it it was ginormous and I had said to Sinead you'd normally have one of these at an event but obviously the cost involved in that we don't need to get she's no we're getting that so like, like that's testament to Sinead and she'd push and she'd say to me, don't sacrifice creative choices on the thing. We'll get it. Like we'll find the money for it because I'd be very budget conscious then as well. Whereas yeah. Sinead pushes me in that direction then. It's normally the other way around. The director's like, oh, I want this and I want that. Yeah, I just I, I always said, yeah, let's not sacrifice anything. Let's let's go for it. Like we're going to make this as real and as authentic as possible. You know, so, um, yeah, I just just we found the money, <laughs> you know. So you mentioned color palette. I was really struck by the opening image. And I think yellow plays a role um, in the film. It's strong. I wonder, was that driven by that's exactly what you wanted from the get go? Or did Finding Parky Cueve also begin to inform your color palette and how you built that? So yeah, the yellow is strong through it, and you like a lot. There's like a lot of motifs to the Wizard of Oz. Um, so you've got like the yellow brick road, and you'll see like little motifs throughout the film, um, because it's basically the same story. It's you know like the Wizard of Oz is about a young damsel who gets thrust into the underworld, and she must overcome challenges to re or like to grow her identity and you know grow up and become a woman. So like this was basically the same story and um, I wanted all like yellow was a big thing through the film. Like uh, it wasn't one of the primary colors um, and I, I always wanted um, Tony to have that splash of yellow and gold in her black outfit. But again, some of that then was homage to Katie Taylor. You know, like I love her values, like how she carries herself outside of the ring. I mean, like she's she's an icon in it, but she's also a, an icon outside of the ring. And she's an inspiration to so many people. So we did want to pay homage to her in that way. And like the simple hairstyle, as opposed to the elaborate ones that the other girls had. You know, we had this idea that, you know, Tony couldn't even afford to do that, to get that hair piece in. So she has to do it DIY. Um, uh, so yeah, like the, all that yellow stuff was uh, homage to, or sorry, motifs of the Wizard of Oz. And then I wanted it to, like some of the people said, oh, we want it to be real gritty and would there be splashes of green? And I said, no, it's gonna be rich in color. It's like, this is the entertainment business. We might be down in the dungeons of a stadium, 
but this is the entertainment business so it's colorful and it's excitement and it's electric so i wanted to get that across and what you know i definitely wanted like a bold look to the costumes like even one of the actors was saying to me oh, i don't want to wear this hat ray the who's the like the manager backstage and i was like no this is a bold look like these are you know we want them to stand out and, and these people have links to the underworld and so we wanted to get all that across in the costumes in as well i have to say i didn't make the wizard of oz connection directly myself but i just want to read you the note that i have regarding um the opening image in yellow which is really striking opening image which almost becomes a motif as it repeats itself also in a sense later on with mary so i think your intention there paid off entirely even if i didn't make the exact connection so um i love it like the opening image is a it's 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 bookended with the end of the film and with mary just to say like like you know because we're I'm trying to get across to the audience that if Tony goes out to the ring and fights and, you know, fights for her dream, she could end up like Mary. She could like, that's, that's the cost involved here. Like, so it's high stakes for her. So yeah, like we didn't just want pretty images in there. And that's another thing we you know, myself and Mark sat down and said, like, it, it, we want it to look stunning, but it has to serve the story. And, just, and he was great that way. Like, he's not looking for stuff for his portfolio. He's looking to serve story all the time. So that was great. I think, ultimately, the best work you're going to get for your portfolio is work that serves story. 100%. I wanted to ask you about the lovely, poetic, almost literary narrative device, which is the initially maybe feels like voiceover and we realize um, that Tony is listening to it. Um, where did that idea come from? Um, I don't know where it actually came from, but I would see a lot of stuff online where you've got all these motivational speakers and a lot of it's guff. And some of it, I would actually, I took it and I put my own little twist on it. And some of it verbatim, you know, like that, that's a line I've seen in a meme. And, but, I wanted it like to start off that way that you're saying, well, you know, what's he really talking about? And then for it to pay off at the end when she's listening to this voice. And some of it is her in her life. It's, you know, what she's thinking at the time, even though she's listening to on the headphones, that's what she's going through. And one of the first images I had from the film was her, that opening shot of her on the ground doing her warm ups and listening to a motivational speaker on the headphones, I was like, it's a, good, it's a great way to start off the film. It's a great way to grab the audience. And then I was like, but now I need that voice. I need someone that's going, you know, that you don't know, is it a demon, some, something from hell, or is it like an angel? And so I always pitched John Connors to Sinead from the start. We were like, yeah, if we could get John, it'd be great. And, and as soon as I spoke to John, now John was initially interested in doing one of the coaches, but you know yourself, we've got so many people, it just didn't work out. And I said, look, John, come in and do this voiceover for me. It's such an integral part of the film. And I've always had you in mind for it. Like you, you're perfect for it. And like, I can't imagine the film without that voiceover in it. He delivers it beautifully. Like it's, it's a character in itself, really, that voiceover, isn't it? Yeah. He's got that real earthy, earthy voice, you know, I think it's class. But I, I love that you kept it literary and it's like prose and there's something very captivating about it. Like it pulls you in as well. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a momentary escape from that world. And when she puts them headphones, she's blocking out. She's blocking out the greed and the lies and the scandals and all the conflict that's going on backstage. And so it did have to be different. And even when I was sitting down with the with our sound mixer, we were like, let's lift that voice, even lift the volume of it above everything else. So it's this escapism for her. I, I'm going to move on to Sinead. You mentioned earlier um, after one of the takes, I think, 
or one of the scenes kind of just being shaking. I could be wrong, but there is a particular shot in the film, Morris. There's a you you utilize long takes um a number of times throughout it, which really work, but it's also a brave choice. Um there is one two shot um in there between uh Coach Emma and Tony. And as I watched, I mo- I was initially almost expecting the cut. I was expecting to go into um a close up and coverage and cross shooting it, but I don't get it. It doesn't come. And it kind of forces you to engage and lean into that scene in a different way because you sit with the two of them in this moment for so long. I thought it was great. I had a question, which was, did you shoot coverage and not use it? Or did you always plan for that to play like that? And then kind of sub question, was that the scene, Sinead? Yeah, that was the exact scene. Yeah, it was. I let Morris answer that that question, but it was absolute magic, magic in the air. I I had goosebumps. Um, it was just like Kira as well. We we were just bouncing around the place after after we did the scene, and actually we didn't do it that many times. Um, we. I remember Morris, like Morris has a very subtle way of directing. He'll 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 come up to you and he'll uh he'll he'll whisper something in your ear so that the other character doesn't hear or the other actor doesn't hear what he's saying. So he might give you a different motivation or whatever. But I remember him just coming up to me and he basically saying, Sinead, I have no notes for you. Keep doing what you're doing. And he had no notes for Kira because it was just so visceral and it was so real and absolutely in the moment for the two of us it was just absolute sparks magic as an actor it was one of the best moments of my entire life I I just Jason I think you've acted before as well it was just magical it was it was beautiful yeah yeah well when you said earlier on about that moment I it had to be that scene because what you're describing is how it plays and how it feels when you watch it as well. Um, again, it's just them bold choices. Um, so that was planned. It, that was a two shot. When I was writing it, it was a two shot. I was like, there's no need to go in for coverage here. And so I sat with Mark and we just, I was like, okay, they're going to, you know, the scene starts off where they're hand wrapping and we have that coverage. And that's almost like a rehearsal process amongst them. And that's when I gave Sinead the note. I was like, I've no notes for you, you just do your thing. And they just went down and they played out that two shot together. And Mark, the cinematographer, was we were sitting right next to each other. And I like not to look into a monitor. This film I did, I, I, I watched a lot of it on the monitor. Normally I don't. And I wasn't looking at this scene on the monitor and I was just sitting next to Mark and after the scene, he actually he showed me his arm and all the goosebumps were up on it. And we, I think we did like three takes of it and they were all brilliant. And it was just like, right, that's it. We've enough. And of course, there's a temptation to go in for the coverage. Like you say, there's something that you mightn't see. It could be a mic pack sticking out that no one has noticed or what, whatever. And... But again, it was just about making them brave choices. And you know, we did that throughout the film, right? We've got it. And we didn't want to shoot loads of coverage. And we didn't want to go back to shots that we already shot. You know, if we, if we had started on a wide and went into a medium, we're never going back to the wide again. Um, you know, it's, it's simple stuff like that. So like, there's no secrets. It's just about being brave with the choices. And I think when you're working that way, everyone ups their game then as well. Because like sometimes the actors would say, to me, are, are we doing any coverage on this? I'm like, no, we're done. Like, you have to be on your A game all the time. There's no, like, saving the best until a, a close-up is coming because it mightn't be coming. I love that um, idea of making those bold choices. And I would it be safe to say that as an editor as well, you know, you know where your cuts are. So you can be even bolder again because you're not footage isn't going to someone else who's going to say 
where's the close up or where's this or where's that? You can just, you know exactly what you're cutting when you're on set. Yeah. And like that's one of the, it's definitely a strong point of mine in that I edit and I consider myself a very good editor. So when I'm on set, like I'm very confident about what we're shooting. I know if we do or do not have it. And, but that's not just good for me. It's great for the crew because then the trust that they have in you, like they know you know what you're doing. And so that just feeds into them, that feeds out to the actors. It's just this loop of confidence that goes around with everyone then. So yeah, like I'm, I'm never like flustered. Now I was flustered with the whole, the anticipation of shooting so many people together. Cause you know yourself, like even if you, if you add one person into a scene, you're like, oh, okay, how does this affect our coverage here? Like when there was 15 of them in the dressing room, like I was dreading it, dreading it coming that day. Like, and I had it marked on the, on our, on our uh, call sheets and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, I hope I can get through this. Um, so that was challenging. And even as an editor, you know, like Mark would contact me in the nights that I can't sleep. Are you sure we've got our eye lines correct and stuff? So like that was difficult. But again, having, you know, with the editing experience and doing so much of it, that really helped me. I knew all, I was like, you know, we're definitely on course here. We're okay. Yeah, because Morris, I mean, you're generally a very, you're, you're, you have this very un, unassuming confidence about you. And even Kira said that to me as a director, like you've just got this, quiet confidence uh, and people just automatically put, sort of believe in you and, and 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 give you their trust and stuff um that day you were or those days in the dressing room you were you were a bit stressed obviously because you know you, you there's so many people in a dressing room there's going to be a bit of messing as well you know um then Condren, god almighty <laughs> biggest messer in town so like um i had to just kick into producer mode every now and then and get him to rein it in and just and like it just takes that one person as well to just bring the whole thing down or Put, put everything into make everything chaotic you know so um you know we were we you were stressed and you had you had a lot to deal with really it, those days in the dressing room and honestly you did you did do an amazing job as a, as a director you didn't blow your fuse you were you were calm cool and collective like so in, in fairness to you on the outside yeah on the outside yeah and now and now in fairness to the cast like when you do have that many people in the room and then you've the cast behind them, of course, you're going to have to, you have to control the energy in that room then as well. And then some like Ben was fantastic and I would let him off his leash. Sometimes people needed perking up and there's no one better than Ben around. And then at times you'd say to him, Ben, uh, let's rein it in there. And he'd like straight away, he'd click into gear and know what the other actors want and they they were just fantastic. Like you couldn't do it without a team that we had on that shoot. And, you know, because like we, you know, we don't have, you know, we'd a, we'd a couple of ADs there and like we don't have a huge crew to control everything like that. And you'd external stuff going on, like the GA players would go into the dressing room next to you. That would break the flow and Sinead would have to go into them. Tell us Sinead. It was very funny. Yeah, we had noise coming from the second dressing room at one point. And um, obviously, you know, Coach Emma um, loves uh, to display her her boobs in the in the film. So she's got this very low cut top. And um, I'd have to just literally like I'd I'd, I'd snap out of actor mode and into producer mode. And, and I knew I have to go into a dressing room full of lads, like GA lads, just to tell them to shut up. So the, the crew used to laugh at me because I'd be there zipping up the zipping up the top before I went in and I'd go in then I'd be like, hey lads, how's it going? I'm just wondering, you know, if you could just like be quiet or whatever. And then I'd come in and the zip would go back down then straight away, it was comical. Very, very funny. I think, um, Morris, you handled 15 cast in a dressing room masterfully as well. So I think one of the last things I would love to pick your brains on is in some sense the elephant in the room, which is the boxing film where we never get to a boxing ring, which I think is also when you talk about those bold and brave choices, Morris, I think it's brilliant. It's such a bold choice to make and you handle it very 
creatively and inventively where as I was approaching the end of the film, hang on, I don't think we're going to see the, a fight here. What happens? How are you going to manage that audience expectation? How many conversations did you guys have early on about, I guess, that aspect of the film? Like, were you at certain points initially saying, no, we need to get in the ring or how do we do that? And how did you come to the ending as it currently is? Yeah, so it wasn't a bold choice. It was forced on us. Like that's for, you know, I knew when I was writing the script, I was like, I can't afford to have a boxing match. I just can't, that's not in the budget. So I also knew that an audience going to watch a boxing film, they want to see the boxer, the underdog rise above and overcome their challenges in the ring. And I knew I couldn't do that, but I had to do it in some sense. So when I was writing, that actually became my superpower then and helped me write the whole film and make them other bold choices to get where we ended up with. Now, I, and I, Sinead and I did discuss it and I would say that my one fear is that people would go to it again expecting to see that boxing match and I didn't want to let them down. So we had to have that powerful ending. So it was just a case of building up towards that and for it to organically happen, you know, without speaking about the end of the film. Um, so, you know, just for that, for that payoff at the end. I loved how you handled it and how you kind of wove the off-screen commentary um, into the fight that we're seeing and how the dynamics of this off-screen commentary shift with the dynamics of what we're seeing and that struggle. Um, I also found myself with a big grin on my face, also trying really hard to trying like really focusing on what's happening and also trying to interpret um the visuals with the commentary and trying to make out well what's going to happen yeah and and some of that was actually inspired by the prize fighter because when we were doing that again it was a budgetary issue where we couldn't get um footage of certain fights but we would use commentary and at the time, the script I was writing, the one that got knocked back during COVID, I had been using a lot of radio at the time in that as well. So it felt very natural to bring that into Swingboat and say, okay, even though the audience can't see the stuff, I can make them hear it and I can make them create the visuals in their head. But then I, need, I, I still needed that extra payoff at the end. I always knew that when I started writing it. I said, that's not going to be enough for them just to hear what's going on in the ring. There has to be something else. So that, that's where the subplots grew out of then. Um, well, look, it worked for me really, really well. And I was left really satisfied. Um, so... Again, all I can say is congratulations on a brilliant film. I have two more questions for you. Um, one, for both of you, what was the hardest part of the process? For me, I think, I think as a producer, a producer is a lonely road, you know, um, you try to protect everyone and everything. Um, obviously, Morris, you're one of my best friends as well. And I would have shared uh, a lot of, you know, concerns that I might have had in the pre-production days or whatever. But I didn't share my stress levels. And um, I was quite anxious coming up to the whole thing because I couldn't afford to hire so many people so I was you know doing a lot of the, the the leg work myself but I did have a little mini breakdown at one point I remember just sitting on the bed crying at one point saying I don't want to do this anymore but for me I think it was the fact that it was it's it, it is it is a lonely process as a producer because you are trying to 
protect people and keep stuff from people and I didn't want to share really with Morris how how anxious I was because I wanted him to concentrate on his role and what he needed to do because he had a very challenging time ahead of him so I think for me that was probably the most challenging personally anyway. Thank you for sharing that that's particularly interesting and probably not something people would think about that like producers do work generally to protect directors and protect the project but there's no one who protects them yeah pretty much um and and obviously I mean like Morris was there for me as a friend and everything but yeah you just you just have to take it on the chin and just you know lean into it you know and and and, and do the job but it is it is very much a, a lonely process I feel anyway but but ultimately very rewarding as well this is why I do it right I love it you know so yeah, that was that was mine anyway Mark I don't know what was the hardest thing for you yeah I, I, I've already spoken about my most challenging and it was you know it was the technical side of just nailing that dressing room when I knew that all 15 I might even be 16 characters at one stage but definitely 15 were in the dressing room and how like to like the film would fall apart if I didn't nail that. So that was my most challenging and it was more the anticipation of it. You know, once we got to it, I was like, yeah, you know what, it's actually okay. But then, you know, once we, f once we finished that schedule, I was so relieved to get out of the dressing room then. Cause like we were all started going stir crazy in there cause everything starts to look the same. And you're just like, oh, am I, am I actually doing this? And you would wake up at night thinking, I hope that's right. I hope I didn't mess up there today. And um, but yeah, so for me that was the most challenging. All the other bits, I, I like. I love the whole process. I love it from from idea all the way to the minute you hand it over to the audience. What were and again a question for both of you? Um, what was the biggest mistake or the biggest lesson you each learned on this film that you have taken from this process that you will maybe look at bringing into future work um i don't i don't have a mistake um obviously you learn micro stuff as you go along um and like one of like a very simple thing i it was during the shoot i actually showed one of the girls megan how a boxer would react when they have a brain injury just the blinking that they do and i showed it on my phone i was like I wish I had used my phone a bit more just to show scuffles and stuff like that. And um, so you'd learn micro stuff like that. And, you know, and for me, it's when I get to the end of each project, I'm like, right, how can I take that next step to tell a bigger story the next time? Whatever that bigger story is, you know, you can just keep growing. But I, like I don't I yeah, I don't have a mistake that I could relate to you. Like, obviously, I make mistakes all the time on set, but, you know, nothing that I'd go, oh, my God, I made a huge mistake there. And, like, mistakes are great to make because you learn from them then as well. I think I would probably um, get a production manor manager in sooner rather than later. Um, I think because what I, I was talking about getting the, the stress levels there when I when I kind of took all of that stuff on, um I would delegate more for sure. Um I'm I, I find it hard to delegate. I kind of tend to want to just do it all myself. So I think, yeah, I think that's what I'd do. I'd get I'd get more of a production team in sooner, a pre-production team or whatever, and, and and delegate things more. Um, yeah. Okay. I always just find it curious because, as you said, Morris, it's not necessarily like you make big mistakes, but there's always these little things, you know, and some things, small things can sometimes be big lessons. And it's always, I think sometimes the thing that's so difficult about that, though, is there is so many of them when you're making indie film that can be hard to distinguish because you learn just to use them as kind of creative leverage in a sense. Yeah. And you learn like I saw a small like there was a time I would never look into a monitor. And I am for this whole film, I watch most of it through the monitor because I just started on day one just to see how the corridors are. And I was like, and I just went with that process. So I would use the monitor a bit more. 
um, you know, little things like that that you learn and obviously, you know, how you speak to actors and how you speak to your crew and you just grow with each project. Like you feel like you take it, you know, once you, once you come out of it, once you hand it over to the audience and then you start on your next thing, you realize kind of what a quantum leap you're taking in your learning process. So like I'm like I'm super excited just to start again. Like I'm writing already, have the next thing kind of ready to go. Like I'm just doing a little rewrite and it's just that excitement to get on to the next thing. That kind of segues nicely into what is the next thing. I know Swing Belt will have its festival run and sales and distro, but in terms of moving on to the next thing, um, do you guys have the next project kind of lined up that you want to work on? Can I, before we go there, Morris, can I backtrack just quickly before we just move on? Um, there's one thing I did want to mention, and it was around the whole, whole um, giving people that creative freedom and stuff. Um, we worked with uh, an amazing um, a guy who did our score for us, Brian Pepper, and I just wanted to um, bring him just, just to be, give a big shout out to him. And actually, Jason, for you down the road as a director, he's an amazing, amazing composer and musician. And it, he, it, this was probably one of his first largest projects to work on. And again, and, and himself and, and Antimo, who did, who did our sound design, Morris, we gave them like total creative freedom. And obviously you had an idea what you wanted from a score point of view, but Brian went all out. Like he took uh, two months off of work just to specifically design the music for us. And he was hiring like drummers in LA and all these different musicians. Um, so I just wanted to give a big shout out to them before we did move on. So I loved the instrumentation as well in the score, particularly um, I'm trying to remember specific bits but like i there was kind of some horn sections and stuff and i thought it was great yeah the build-up i think the build-up that 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 develops slowly you know as with all the, the the drums and like war drums or whatever yeah yeah really really good um i'll definitely check out brian's work do please yeah so sorry yeah morris you can jump in there with the the next project oh yeah uh so we we're scheduled to shoot a film in 2020 and I'm going back to that. But I like I put it on the back burner when COVID happened and I just wanted to see how my viewpoint of the world may or may not have changed through COVID and then go back to the script. And so I'm rewriting that at the moment. We haven't had big discussions about it, about when we'll shoot, who's going to be, you know, casting or anything. But we just know that that would be the next project. Can you see yourselves doing that um, in a similar independent vein? Or will you try and look at different avenues? Again, they take longer, which can be the challenge. Yeah, it's not, it's um, like we did swing bout because we didn't want it to take longer because of the fact that we had one project get knocked back it had been a while since we did our last project before it and we just didn't want another huge gap to be able to filmmake and we were like we want to make something now so now that we've this over the line um i'll get the script finished and then we'll see we'll be like right what's best for this film who's the best people to go to like do we bring it to screen ireland get it funded get great people behind it do we do it indie is it that type of film so we'll see once i've it finished i just wanted to say i loved swing belt i loved its inventiveness its energy and its braveness i admire and respect the pair of you and the work that you both do your passion and that kind of punk filmmaking attitude is an inspiration I'm very glad that you guys didn't wait for permission to make this film. Congratulations again. It's a massive achievement. And thank you guys very much. That's a wrap on Morris and Sinead. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow and rate us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's a great way to support the show. If you have comments, questions, or filmmaking topics you'd like me to cover on the show, please put them in the comments on our Instagram page at the Filmmakers Playbook Podcast. 
For updates on Swingbout, follow at Swingbout Film on Instagram. Links and social media handles can be found in the show notes. Join me next week when I talk to the incredible Louise Lowe about directing theatre, TV and working with actors. Until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>